My way or God's? Matthew chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. I want to share the passage with you first. And we're going to look at it in its unadulterated state, which is the only way to look at Scripture. And then I want to take you maybe to a little bigger picture idea than you might be used to from this passage. So if you're there, read along with me. Behold, there was a man... Actually, let me start in verse 9. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. Remember I said that, their synagogue. That'll come back in a few minutes. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, Jesus, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Folks, this is a classic example in Jesus' continual conflict with the Jewish leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. The Pharisees were so very protective of their system. Matthew writes that Jesus entered their synagogue. And I don't think that's an accident that that word is there. There's no accidents in the word of God. Their synagogue. They considered it theirs. Very important. You're probably aware, though, that the Sabbath in Jesus' day had become highly regulated by the religious leaders. Ten Commandments says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That is true. What man had turned it into was really a sham compared to what God had intended. In Mark chapter 2, verse 27, Jesus says this, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The scholar Walter Wessel makes this note about the Sabbath. He says it was a gift gift of God to man. Its purpose was not to put man in a kind of straitjacket. It was for his good to provide rest from labor and opportunity to worship. Catch that. We are supposed to rest. If you're working seven days a week, that's really not in God's wisdom for you to do that. And I know it gets crazy. I fall into the same trap. It's like six it and getting it done. Seven sometimes isn't getting it done, but the Lord needs us to rest. Paul and I were talking this morning right before the service. She says, when I start to get run down, I get a sore throat. I said, yeah, the Lord's been doing that to me. I, I'm thankful for that. If my throat gets sore, it's usually not because I'm sick. It's because I'm tired. Sometimes I'm sick and tired. But generally speaking, it's time to throw it into neutral for a little while and rest. Our bodies can't keep up after all that time. But it had really morphed in Jesus' day. And so here he stands in the religious center of all these religious men on the most religiously regulated day of the week. And what does he do? He miraculously heals this man with a withered hand. And he goes entirely against their thoroughly thought out system of prohibitions and he shows mercy to this man. And folks, realize that in those days that in order to not run afoul of what they thought was the law, they restricted everything. And it's still kind of in place today, quite frankly. But back then, you couldn't walk more than one and one quarter miles on the Sabbath, or that was work. They had laws against such things as sewing stitches or pulling stitches out. I'm talking about in clothing on that day. I mean, it became ridiculous what they put upon people. And then if you did something and you were found guilty of that, then a whole world of hurt came down on you. But Jesus, just see him here. He's not doing all of this in a vacuum, is he? He's not hiding behind a pillar or in the lurking around in the shadows waiting for these guys to clear out so he can come out and say, come here quick, let me heal you so we can get this done and get out of here. No, he steps out boldly in front of these men. And they know what he's about to do. And they're challenging to do it. And quite frankly, they know his power to heal. That's not up for debate. They knew it was going to happen. They could see it coming. 
But then he turns the challenge on them. And I think that's that's where we need to try to get to today, because that's what this sermon really is all about. Would they allow their sheep to lie at the bottom of some ditch or some pit until the next day if they could rescue that sheep? And so if they couldn't or wouldn't abandon the sheep, then why would they allow this man to live even one more day with this handicap when he could be delivered from it? That's the bottom line to this thing. If Jesus could heal him today, why wait until tomorrow? That doesn't show much love, does it? That doesn't show any grace or mercy. You're struggling. You're hurting. I've got the answer. I'm going to wait till tomorrow to do it. Deal with it, dude. That's basically what they were saying. So Jesus shows his sinless nature and his obedience to God's directive and God's perfect schedule in healing this man on the Sabbath. But instead of giving God the glory and seeing this man healed, Matthew records that the Pharisees wanted to see Jesus destroyed. Why? Because he had not adhered to their view of what being being a righteous and religious person was. And he had operated outside of their comfort level. Now let me pause here for a moment. Um, I I don't like doing this a whole lot, but I think sometimes you've got to just look up words, and I'm using my phone here just because i got dictionary.com on here. I've got dictionary.com on here, yes. Because I, I, words words mean things, right? And in our world today, we've gotten really sloppy with what words mean, frankly. Um, One of my pet peeves is when we talk about Bible stories. And if you go back and look at the word story, story is a fictional account. Something created by a human being. Hansel and Gretel, Little Bo Peep, that kind of thing. Unless it's a parable or it's stated as being fictional in the Bible, it's not a story. It's an account. It's history. It actually happened. Another sloppy word we have is the word spiritual. That's a whole sermon, so come back some other time for that. Another word that we really fumble with in our culture today is the word religion. I talk to people on occasion and I'll say, you know, are you active in a church or you're a follower of Jesus Christ or something, and they'll say, well, I'm not a very religious person. Then jerk in me wants to say, I didn't ask you that. But this is Aloha State, so you show love and you keep rolling. What is religion, though? So I, I, I just looked this up because these guys are religious people. These Pharisees are religious people in a very real sense. Here's two definitions. There's a whole bunch of them. One is a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe especially when considered as the creation of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually involving devotional and ritual observances, and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. That's a mouthful. You you understand why I read that now. I could not keep up with that. On a little shorter variation, and I think this gets more to where people probably are today, something one believes in and follows devotedly, A point or matter of ethics or conscience. And that's kind of where people are. I would relate that more to the idea of having a world view. A world view. How you see where we came from, where we're going, and what matters here in our world today. These people were religious. I think everybody comes into this world religious. We all come up, we all cobble together in our flesh, who we are when we come into this world, some idea of where we came from and what matters in this world. Would you agree with that? Is that that a reasonable statement? Here's what I do know. In our human-made religion, our humanism, if you will, the one thing we don't want to do is follow God. That's an absolute truth. None seeks after God. No, not one. That's what the Bible says. You, You say, well, I sought after God. No, you were probably seeking after answers to why your life was what it was. You're not seeking after God. I didn't seek after God. He seeks after us. He wants a relationship with us. But the problem is is that apart from from Jesus Christ, there's no way to have a relationship with God the Father because our system makes us want to put us in charge of our system. We make us the one that gets the benefit from it. We want to be happy about what we do. And at the end of the day, if we thought we could do it without God, we would. That's just the reality of the human race. Where we have to come to the point is that we realize that we can't do it apart from God. There's no way to have a relationship with Him. And to also figure out that 
we can't be truly fulfilled. There's no way. Into that vacuum comes Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, lived without sin, never ever put himself ahead of God's will in his life. Jesus is God, by the way, but he came to this earth and he lived as a man. All of us sin. All of us fall short of God's perfection. All of us want to put ourselves in the, in, in the driver's seat of our lives. Jesus came and never did that. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. That means, in other words, if we live this entire life for ourselves, at the end of that, we die the human death. But there's also this idea that the Bible describes very eloquently in many places of the idea of being separated from God for an eternity. And the place that it happens after your death is a place called hell. That's where we're all destined, apart from God, apart from Jesus Christ. When Jesus came and lived that perfect life, He gave Himself as a willing sacrifice to die for your sin and mine. To take that penalty, the wage, upon Himself. He died on that cross 2,000 years almost ago because He is God. The blood that He shed was sufficient to cover every sin you and I would ever, cre ever commit and everybody else for that matter. The wages of sin is death, but the second part of that verse is but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess through the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Because you see, Jesus raised, was raised from the dead three days later. And He never died again. And that death, that blood, is the avenue to a relationship with God the Father. You can lay aside the religion, your religion, that puts you in charge. Your religion that has all kinds of other answers for why things are. And you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And a relationship with God the Father. Because folks, I'm convinced that mankind is always going to create religion. I had this conversation with a pastor friend of mine this week. He, he was talking to me about the fact that there's a number of Christians that are trying to go back to all the, all the Jewish sacrifices and all of that. Well, see, Jesus fulfilled every Jewish sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled every Jewish festival, every single one of them. But mankind wants to always return to religion because we want to think that what we do pleases God. One last thought, then I'm going to continue with the second part of the sermon. Folks, Isaiah, the prophet, says, Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. What that means, let me give it to you brass tacks. That means that the best thing, I mean, if you get to the end of your life and someone were to ask you on your deathbed, what is the best thing you ever did? And you named it. That is gutter garbage compared to God's goodness. See, that doesn't seem quite fair. That's because, guys, that's in our power. On the flip side, you give a cup of water to a thirsty person in the name of Jesus Christ, and God is honored by that. That's how it works. If you're basing your life on religion, whatever it is, you can lay that aside today and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're going to give an invitation here in a few minutes at the end of this sermon, and you can do that today. It would be our greatest honor to lead you to know Jesus today. We'll pray about that in a few moments. Remember, we're talking about my way or God's way. Because here's, here's a dirty little secret. We Christians get caught up in this too, sometimes. What do I mean by that? What about us? Lots of times we construct our own synagogues. And we develop our own rules. And we expect for God to operate according to our preconceived parameters. If you will, we put God in a box. It's easy to do that. I don't think we mean to. And I'm not here to beat you folks up today. I fall into that trap. I get used to the way I like God operating. And I want God to keep doing it that way because I'm comfortable with that. Anybody catching where I am on that? We like a comfortable God. We really do. Now, think about this. I want to give it to you in two levels. One, I've seen this in churches. I've been, I'm, this is the third church I've pastored. And I've been involved with a lot of other churches along the way. And I have friends who are pastors in churches here and all over the place. And I've, I've seen churches really go out of their way sometimes to front their idea of what God wants to do instead of what God wants. I think the most extreme I ever saw of this, and this goes back to the mainland many years ago, 
I saw a church that was a predominantly white church in a predominantly white part of town. And over about 25 years, the population of that town changed and became very mixed in that population base. The old people that were still in that church decided that they would rather sell the building and move to another part of town where there are people like them instead of ministering in that town, in that place where they were planted. You say, that sounds pretty judgmental, Bruce. You know what, at the end of the day, I don't know what their hearts were. But I just remember shaking my head and going, man. And, and where, I saw, where I saw the rub was right here. Be, beyond what the motivations might have been. They had basketball goals out in their parking lot. And the local kids from the community were coming down there and shooting hoop in the parking lot. And they ran them off. You can't be here. You can't be here. Guess what? If they weren't going to shoot hoops in the parking lot, I guarantee you they weren't coming into the church. Faux show. Sure. We had the opportunity to church my first pastorate. I, God put it a little more in my face than that. We had, a, we, we had kind of a low-income area a apartment complex that was down the street. And people told me the first couple of years I passed there, don't go down there, it's dangerous. And I was kind of buying that. I was buying that. I was believing that. And what the Lord did was he brought a couple of the boys, young, you know, they're like 15, 16 years old, brought them from that to our church and said, you know, it's cold. Can we use your gym to play basketball? I couldn't dodge that one. I said, sure, let's do it. Folks, within three months, we had 75 young men showing up on Tuesday and Thursday night to play basketball. I'd love to tell you that was my great idea. It wasn't at all. But I was blessed by it. That's a little lead in to the end of the sermon, right? It's not always what we want to do, but when we follow God's will, we are blessed beyond measure. Got to know some of those young men pretty well, and I was, I was pretty pleased. But, you know, I thought about it, and the Lord kind of put this on me this week. Remember the day of Pentecost? Remember that Acts chapter 2? Peter gave that great sermon. The church was running about 120 that day. At the beginning of the day, the church is about 120 people. And, by, and Acts chapter 2 says that that day about 3,000 were added to their number. My first thought was, where are they going to put all those people? That's pastor math, right? I'm going, oh my goodness. We got to get some Sunday school teachers lined up. We got to get some disciplers lined up. What do we do? What do we do in our churches today if 3,000 were added on one Sunday? Or maybe on a Wednesday night Bible study. Wow, that would really freak people out. What if it was 30? Even 30 will freak folks out. It's like, we can't baptize that many folks. Oh, by the way, for those of you that, that do immersion baptism, we got the best baptismal pool in the world right there. We can, we can line them up 500 deep. It wouldn't be a problem. We'll just get it rolling. So, and it's, uh, it's nice water. I, I know folks back on the mainland sometimes baptize in, in rivers, and that's a little chilly, especially in the winter. It's nice 24-7, 365 out here, so right on. But that's the church. What about our personal lives? Because this is where the Lord has convicted me about this passage this week. And he said, I thought we were talking about Jesus healing. Well, guys, step back and realize that, that sometimes God is not giving us these passages just to wail on the Jewish people. He's giving it to us to give us a general principle to challenge us in our own lives. And that's where we are in this passage. But let me say this to you. One thing I know, and I probably can get an amen or two on this one. The older I get, the less I like change. Right? Christine and I uh, cut the cable this week. No, I didn't give up TV. This is all a sports-oriented kind of thing. I couldn't get the channel I wanted without paying more for my cable. And I was like, fine. It's going to be that way. But then came the battle. Because all the different streaming services and everything might have carried the channel I wanted, but somebody in my household who you saw earlier was going to miss some of her channels. So now it became this... Let me use the right word. We are in church. <laughs> Negotiation. It's like, well, I'll give you these two sport channels and you give me these three channels and we're all good. So we finally found a streaming service that gave us the best mix of all the channels that we wanted. But now, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't even going through that. You know what the challenge was for a guy that's 58 years old? I got to learn a new remote. 
I was real happy with my old remote. And now I've got to learn a new one. So come on, if God comes out of the woodwork and says, I need you to do something different, we're going to fight on that one, guys. Lord, I'm already reading my Bible. I'm already going to church. I'm already praying. I'm already involved in, in, in Bible study and, and, and whatever else you're involved in. And you say, I, 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 I'm happy here. You've been blessing me here. You want me to do something different? And we can fight him on some crazy stuff. Lord, I like my new King James. You want me to read the Bible this year out of the NIV or something? What? Don't knock me for versions, guys. It's all good. Just, just, just trying to get a point out there. Because I tell you, it comes down to it, and I mean, it's just brass tack stuff. Am I going to meet the Lord calling me to do something different with a grin or a groan? And the older I get, the more groany I get. And you say, but wait a minute, you're a pastor. Guys, I got the same clay feet. Guaranteed. So it's not going to change in me. But, but how would you respond to him? And it could be a ministry thing. Maybe he's asking you to, and it could be simple. And we've, we've talked about this a couple of times in our group. It, it, it could be as simple as, as going across the street to the neighborhood grump, right? And just saying, could I help you move that load of dirt? Go over there with a shovel on your arm, ready to help. The guy has been nothing but a pain to you. But he says, show them love and grace and go do that. It could be a new ministry. I, I have a funny hunch knowing that there are a number of young people that are here from YWAM that there was probably a moment in your life where you were kind of cool going the way you were going and all of a sudden God said, I'd like for you to move conveniently to Kailua Kona, Hawaii. Well, Lord, that's not what I had in my five-year plan don't really care what your five-year plan is. Let's do my five-year plan. I see some smiles back there. I get that. Maybe some of you others have gone through that. I'll tell you this, and, and I don't want it to be about me, but this is, this is honest. Christine and I knew we were sensing a call of the Lord to Hawaii, and we said, Lord, anywhere but the Big Island. <laughs> don't be insulted, Big Islanders. I would not live anywhere else. We got here and we thought, huh, this isn't bad. This isn't bad at all. And those Maui guys, they wear their Maui no ka'oi, Maui no better. <laughs> Big island no ka'oi, right on. In case you don't know it, we islands are very competitive. We're like ball teams. So we're all about that kind of thing. I, 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 I couldn't wear an Oahu shirt here or a Kauai shirt here. I'd lose my Big Island citizenship. But... You know, you just, just kind of think through that path. It's like we get so, so comfortable serving the Lord in the way we're doing it. And, and I'm not knocking that. You may be just knocking it out of the park with the Lord. But if He comes at you with something new, what's going to be the answer? What's going to be the answer? And I think the large extent of why we struggle with that is fear. Fear of the unknown. And not really trusting the Lord. And you say, well, you're meddling now. But I think it's true. We, we, it's like, Lord, and, and you get that well up in your spirit. Because how many of us really want to try something we're not good at? Right? I, I, I became a real estate agent about three years ago or something like that. And, and I tell you, I told Christine the other day, I said, I'm just now getting comfortable with like writing the contracts and doing all the stuff. I like the showing the houses and doing all that kind of thing. But it just, it just, I wasn't comfortable with it. It just didn't feel right. And I finally got there, but it took a long, long time. And, and I think we can get that way in ministry sometimes, but we just got to trust the Lord. And I love the fact that John MacArthur, or not Mac, John MacArthur, John Maxwell wrote a book about this. It's called Failing Forward. That's a wonderful idea. Even if you mess up, you're getting further down the path. You understand what I'm saying? It's, it's a great idea, and I would encourage you to think that way. But I think that the Pharisees were fearful and they, they said all the right things and they gave the appearance that they wanted to do God's will. But when perception met reality, it was obvious that they really only wanted to obey God as long as he didn't shake up their system. And that's got to be different in the believer's life. We've got to trust that the Lord, when he calls us to do something, he's going to give us the equipping to do it. He's going to get the people in our place. He's going to have us in a ministry that it works. He's going to go ahead of us and he's going to pave the way for us. 
And so there may be one person here this sermon is for this morning. I don't know. But all I can say is this. If you're right now at a point in your life and you're struggling with, Lord, do I or don't I? Don't let fear be the thing that keeps you from doing it. This is kind of an add-on sermon to last week's with this idea that sometimes the Lord will call us to do things, but He cautions us that there's going to be some struggles along the way. That doesn't mean He doesn't want us to do it. He wants us to go in, wide, eyes wide open. But check this. At the end of this passage, verse 15, it says that they, were, they said they had plotted to get rid of Jesus. And in verse 15, it says, But when Jesus knew it, He withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them all. Here's the point. Jesus didn't continue to waste his time in this religious but unspiritual place. Also, he recognized that he was in danger and that his time hadn't yet arrived to be crucified. So he left and he was followed by a horde of people. And Matthew records that all of them that followed were healed by the Lord. Folks, here's the point. God is going to get his will done. God's plan will be accomplished. The question for each one of us is whether we will be the willing, faithful, and joyous participants in that plan. I'd hate to think, and I, I, I certainly don't want to show before the Lord, and He's judging me for, for what I've done with this, this life. And he, said, he says, I had this amazing, this amazing thing laid out for you, and you didn't do it. Brother Bill over there, he got the blessings for that. They could have been yours. And so this morning, folks, I just ask you this question as we close. Can you, can you say this morning, Father, use me no matter what the task. Not my will, but yours be done. If you can't, pray that He change that in your heart to be open for new things, whatever they may be. If you can, get ready to be blessed. Let's bow our heads.